Luke 17, if you'll take the word of God. And I can read uh, this entire passage, I could be tempted to, but I really want to draw out one verse that just gives a phrase that, that has, captures my, has captured my attention through the years, really, through the years, really. Uh, but certainly as we think about what God is having us to speak about this night for just a little while. But in Luke chapter 17, and then we'll just move along to verse 10. It says here, and so likewise ye, when ye shall have done all those things which are commanded you, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which is our duty to do. We have done that which is our duty to do. Interesting. This passage has a, has a context, and I'm not going to speak in the context. I'm going to save that for when I get there in my preaching through the book of Luke. We're going to preach it contextually, expositionally then. But I just want to lift that phrase because it's a convicting phrase. It's, a, it's an, an important phrase on the very last part of that, we have, which is our, that which is our duty to do. And, of course, this has a lot to do with how we should treat one another and how, how, we, sh how we should behave. But that, there's, an, there's a, just an open secret here that we have a duty to serve the Lord. As saved individuals, we have a duty to serve the Lord. Jesus Christ is our great leader. And as a Christian, as a believer, as a part of the family of God, we've now been called. We know that Jesus' last words was the word of what? To go into all the world and to preach the gospel. There's a work to do for the Lord. Evangelism and discipleship, because in that effort to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, we're baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We're teaching them all things whatsoever I have commanded you, Jesus said. He said, lo, I am with you even unto the end of the world. That is a mission statement that's been, <laughs> that is still being fulfilled 2,000 years later. And sometimes we feel like we haven't even touched the hem of the garment. There's plenty to do for the Lord. Amen. Plenty to do for the Lord. And I'm firmly convinced because of my, my study of the Bible that God's work is done within the context of the local New Testament church. You read the word of God, and, and I think, God, uh, if you want to look at it with me this way, if you look back to the Old Testament, when we look at the Old Testament, there's an emphasis on genealogy and family, and rightfully so. And Jesus did not come to negate that. But as we turn the page into the New Testament, it has written in Christ's blood an agreement between God the Father and God the Son about the work they would do in revealing themselves to the world. Then we have a New Testament emphasis is made then on local New Testament churches. That is not to the negation of family. That does not negate family. For as we read the New Testament, we understand that husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church in the book of Ephesians. And lives, wives are to submit to their husbands and children over there in chapter 6, one of our favorite verses, right? To obey their parents and the Lord. Can I get an amen right there? Yes. And uh, so we know that's all there. It's not to negate the principle of family, but we see the emphasis of the local New Testament church. And Paul writes in the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to church after church after church after church after church. God's family is bigger than one church, but Jesus Christ is revealed in every community by the work of a local church. Absolutely. It's just revealed that way. And he's called us together to assemble. We, we quote this verse often in Hebrews 10, 25. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as we see the day approaching. Assembly is required. Assembly is required in God's church. That's what we are, a called out ecclesia. And as we think about God's work is done in, by Christians in the context of a local church, no doubt that there are what we'd call parachurch organizations that exist outside of the local church. And I, I'm glad for those. I believe there are many of those we can help and support. But God's program in this age of grace is the local New Testament church. There's no doubt about it. No doubt about it. Um, we think of friends. We, we have friends that do other things. For instance, the Edge Christian Camp is, is not necessarily a ministry of our church, but is based out of our church through the ministry of one of the members of our church. That is a parachurch organization. I think it's a worthy thing. Bible Truth Music is an organization, a ministry that is based, in, is based out of this church because a member of our church, God has led him uh, to do that ministry and to and see that ministry expand and grow into many different facets. But I want you to know those ministries can exist and function. They cannot replace and they do not, they do not outshine the ministry of a local church. They can't. They're dependent on that. They're absolutely dependent on that. And, as, and those, by the way, Brother Fox would agree with me wholeheartedly. Brother, Brother Scott Carsley agrees wholeheartedly. Their ministry is to the local body of believers, and thank God for that. So we have a work to do. If everybody agrees with that, if we've established that point, would you say amen? amen. I mean, we didn't just get saved to get out of hell. 
We got saved. God saved us to accomplish something for him. There's no question about it. We're drawing God's air. We're nowhere to be a witness. And now over the age, as we've taken the effort, looking at principles in God's word to establish local churches and to see God's work go forward. And then we work on organizing that work for the glory of God. There comes some liberty then in organizing the work. And other churches, how many of you have ever been a part of a different church besides Calvary Baptist Church in Smithfield? And so other churches may organize the work differently. There's not necessarily one absolutely explicit way to organize the church. There's some principles that we adhere to. We think about calling a pastor and having the office of pastor and a deacon and other things that are accomplished. But there's some, there's some liberty in how all that's done. But the Bible does this give us this clear command about whatever we do it for the Lord over in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 40. I think you'll know it very, very well. It's a very short verse in God's word. But it says this, let all things be done decently and in order. So we're not, again, I'm not preaching the context there, 1 Corinthians 14, but I'm pulling that thought topically. We're thinking about the fact here that we have a duty to do, and we ought to do all things decently and in order. And it's not, just, we don't just, excuse me, how do I say this? Pardon my expression. We just don't throw something against the wall and see if it sticks. <laughs> I don't know how else to say it, but I think we all understand that. What we want to do is we, have, we want to be led by God. Be led by the leadership that God's given our church and that we want to serve God and we want to do it decently and in order. No doubt about it. And we have a duty. Thank God for it. Uh, And I know I have a lot of responsibility there. I have a lot of responsibility. If Titus chapter 1 and verse 5 says, Paul writes to Titus, For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. There's a duty. The pastor has a, a responsibility when it comes to things being established on the duties that God has given us and being established decently and in order. And uh, God help us with that. That's something I will stand before the Lord for. We have, we have an opportunity. We have a, a, a great privilege to serve the Lord. Someday that opportunity will be over for me. Sooner than I will expect it to be. Whenever it happens, it will be over sooner than I could imagine. If I live to be 120, it will be over sooner than I could be imagine, I'm sure. And at, this, at this rate, I don't think I'm going to see 120. But uh, whenever it happens... And I'll stand before the Lord, and I'll have an accountability, I really believe, about what I, what I did to help set things in order in this place. Again, not as a lone ranger, not as a dictator, but as a pastor who's been called of God, and God willing, loves the Lord, and then loves God's people, and has a heart, hopefully, to get something done for God. i tell you this, the, 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 the longer I live, and I hopefully, hopefully have a little ways to go, the longer I live, I just know that, man, when I leave this world, I want to leave a legacy of accomplishing something for God. I don't know who will know it, but I hope I know it, and I hope God knows it. I don't know who will know it, but I hope I know it. I hope I know it. I may not know it. There have been a lot of people who left this world didn't know what they did for God. We read their biographies. People that died at such young ages. And we, we, think, we think about them. We, we think about Borden of Yale. I don't know what he thought he left behind, but boy, a lot of preachers sure have referred to his, uh, his heart for God. Amen. Maybe it's selfish to think I would know it, but I sure would like to. <laughs> I sure would like to know that we've done something for the Lord. You know, that's just not going to happen by accident. It's a duty. It's to be done decently and in order, and we must move ahead. A duty is a word that's very little thought of these days, especially when it comes to volunteerism. And we are a volunteer organization for the most part in this church. I thank God. I'm, I'm, I'm blessed. I get, to, I get to make a living at the work that God's given me to do, vocationally, to be, a, be in the ministry. I'm, I'm glad for that. Brother Caleb has that privilege. We're very privileged people. I remind you, my dad started this church and labored year upon year upon year without that privilege. I'm glad he remained faithful in the Lord. Lord blessed him for it, but I, I'm, a, I'm a doubly blessed man. I thank God for it. By the way, the longer this old world goes, I think it's going to be fewer and fewer people like us, Brother Caleb. It's going to be more and more bivocational pastors or, or people that are just ba- basically giving themselves to the ministry of a church without any pay at all. That's where it seems like where it's all headed. You never know. We better count ourselves glad for what the Lord's doing. Someone said our duties abound on every side as a husband, as a wife, as a child, as an employee, as an employer, and certainly as a servant of Almighty God. As believers, we're always on duty for the Lord. And thank God the Lord left us this duty manual. Amen, the Bible. And it gives us what we need to know. And we ought to follow the written instructions. I've read this story to you before, but a soldier was all flustered. And she didn't know what to do. And she ran to her commanding officer and pleaded, Sir, help me. I don't know where I should be or what I should be doing. And the commanding officer was not very pleased, but could, could sense that she meant well. 
So he patiently said, Private, all that you have to do is, all, excuse me, Private, all that you ask has been clearly written in the routine orders. Every soldier has been commanded to become familiar with those orders. Read them and follow the instructions in the future. Do not bother me with questions that you should already know the answer to. Now that sounds pretty stern. But the next person she comes up with might not be that, quite that nice in that regard. I, I quote often to, to you, I was told to me years ago that D.L. Moody said if he had his life to live over again, I believe it was Mr. Moody, that he would pray less and read the Bible more because so many things he was wondering about he found clear answers to in God's word. Yeah. And we have a duty manual. That's the Bible we're looking to adhere to. And we read God's word and there are clear commands in God's word, I remind you. And we derive principles from those clear commands. And from those principles then we develop convictions and standards. And we even develop beyond that modes of operation in God's family and in God's church. And it organizes us together and that's what we attempt to do. And as a Christian we know we have duties. We need to read God's word. We need to be praying. We need to attend church faithfully. We need to give to the Lord. We absolutely need to be doing that. And we need to witness to the lost. These are areas that we should all aspire to as Christians and not really just aspire to. They ought to be a part of our regular Christian living. Amen. We all struggle. We all struggle. I struggle to do those things faithfully like I ought to, but God help us to be faithful. It's our duty. We should not pat ourselves on the back for reading our Bible. We shouldn't pat ourselves on the back for giving to the Lord's work. We shouldn't get a pat on the back for attending church faithfully, even though uh, back in the good old days, people could get a long line of pins, right, when they went, attended Sunday school. And those were the good old days. Some of you don't even know what I'm talking about, but they, used to, they did used to award people for things like that. We shouldn't get a really, uh, because we win somebody to the Lord, it's not necessarily we win a gold medal. It's our duty to do these things. Amen. The best we can say is like Luke wrote there, we're just an unprofitable servant. All I've done is what I've been told to do. But because at times, like in my own life, I, I can't speak for you, because at sometimes in my own life, obedience runs, disobedience runs so high, a few moments of obedience it seems like a, is a mountaintop moment. <laughs> Even though it should be the norm, it's like, woo, I'm having a good day today. I'm pleasing the Lord today. Finally, about time. It's about time I'm getting to these things. When God says, that's what I'd like to see you doing all the time. I want to be a profitable servant, and I want to, I, again, I, I think we ought to be glad for all those things. You understand what I'm saying? I'm not trying to upset anybody or trying to discourage anybody, but these things are absolutely the rungs on the ladder that God has called us to climb, and they should be a part of who we are and what we do. Duty for a servant is very simple and straightforward. Just do everything uh, that, um, that the master commands. Do everything that the master wants, and do it to the best of our ability for God's glory. It's not always glamorous. And sometimes I feel like it never ends. But you know what? This life, as long as it may seem, is really, like I said before, just a blip on the radar screen of eternity. Just a little minor blip of our three score and ten of our reason of strength four score. And they're soon cut off, as the Bible says, and we fly away. And so really, truthfully, when we imagine eternity, we can't do anything too long on this earth that stacks up with eternity. <laughs> It's not always glamorous. Sometimes it feels like our service never ends. And a servant really should not be in it for being thanked. A servant does what's expected, as I said. And, and God help us as servants in this church to do that to the best of our ability. It's something that God wants. And we serve the Lord. Yet at the same time, it takes a level of accountability in a place like this to make sure the work gets done. And I'd encourage you to consider, like many of you always have through the years, that if we're serving the Lord, that we are with, with or without any observable accountability, our accountability is to God, and we're going to give him our dead level best. Amen. Our best. And we have no doubt that God has done his best for us. Amen. No doubt that he's done, done his best for us in sending his precious son to this earth. I thank God for the laborers in this church uh, outside tonight. Some of you may have seen it, may not have made it, all of you have seen it. I'd like you to, to check in if you could before you leave. But I put in just a check-in sheet for our workers, and I said, wow, look at these lists. I pulled them from the Sunday school list. I pulled them from the Master Club Children's Bible Club list. I pulled them from the nursery list. I pulled them from all over the place and the things that go on in this church from our deacons and our trustees and people like that. And we have a list. We have 50 different people, and I may have left some, someone out of this because I only put my eyes on it, and that's, that's the recipe for disaster. Pastor, but um, 50 different people who are committed to serving the Lord faithfully in this church. I want to use that word again, committed. Committed. 
um, committed. That's what I believe that's what we ought to be, committed to the Lord, committed to this church. That amazes me. We put it on two different sheets so everybody wouldn't have to stand around one to check in tonight. We're trying to make sure that our workers are here. By the way, we would like to think that our workers are faithfully attending church. <laughs> and by the way, sometimes we have struggles with that and we have to make sure they are. But if you can't attend faithfully, you can't really serve the Lord. At least not in this place. Because all of our service grows out of our worship, right? All of our service for God must grow out of our worship. And in a place like this, in a, in a public effort, I thank God for your private worship. But if you're going to join a, private, going to join a public group and serve the Lord, we're going to have to publicly worship him too Amen. in order for us to move ahead in all of that. Make sure you check in tonight. There's a long list of, of faithful people. I thank God for all of that. And outside there, along with that, when you checked in, and you'll, you can get that on your way out, no trouble if you didn't before, you'll find some things that we need to update in our church ministry. We have a, a sheet of paper that helps us conduct a background check. Uh, for people that serve in this ministry. We don't, we're not going to do this just for our children's ministry. We're going to do this for anybody that works in the ministry of this church as a volunteer in order to protect all of us, in order to make sure that things are on the up and up and things are right. Amen? And that's uh, something we've gone to in the last several years. It's time to renew all of that. So uh, you may not be able to get all that done this evening, but we'd like you to com complete that within the next week, God willing, by next Sunday night, and be able to get that from you so that we could take care of that and make sure that we have records up to date. So if anyone ever comes knocking, on our door, we have exactly what we need to take care of all that business. Does that make sense to everybody? We're talking about our duty to do. <laughs> this is part of our duty. In 2022, it's part of our duty as a church to make sure all of our workers have a background check. I wish it wasn't true, but just like I said the other day, I wish I didn't have to lock my door at night, but I make sure it's done every night. I'm the last one in the bed, and I touch the lock before I go to bed. I didn't do that 20, 30 years ago, but I'm doing it every night now. There's no doubt about it. That needs to be done. That's our duty to do. There's another document out there that you would have found uh, tonight, which is our church workers covenant. Some of you may have gotten a copy. I handed a copy of that out a couple of weeks ago. If you don't have one now, you can certainly get that on the way out. But uh, we're asking our workers to commit. Covenant's a strong word, isn't it? It's a very strong word. You know, at times I think, oh, I don't, I don't want to scare anybody off with something like this. But I think to myself, we need to be committed to the Lord and to his work. Um, it's, it can be a challenge sometimes just to get, get the work of God done when we're dealing with less than committed and faithful people. And that's something really that begins with God, again, as I said earlier, is we have our duty to do, and we have a duty to serve the Lord. And I've, as I laid it out a moment ago, I believe we serve the Lord best and most through the ministry of a local New Testament church. We do what Jesus would do here in this community. And then beyond that, we read God's word and we get the commands of God's word and the principle of God's word. And, and we develop convictions and standards and modes of operation to function that, that take us back to the word of God. And then we start, we start working. We start growing. We start developing. There was a day here that we didn't even need a Sunday school teacher because we had so few people. Right? Then we started to grow, and then uh, we, we, uh, we were in the Carrollton Rural Team building, and we hung a big old, big old uh, it wasn't the most attractive thing, a blanket up across the room on a cord so you could have adults on one side of it and children on the back side of that. And we put in that, that Rural Team building, we, we put the little bitty children, the nursery children, in the kitchen. And I'm not sure that was the safest place for them to be, but it was where they were. They had fine workers, but I don't even talk about sharp instruments. I'm just not sure it was the cleanest place I'd ever been in my life. That's all I'm saying. But we had that. We started to do that. Pastor, my dad, Pastor Gray, he was, he was teaching. I'm sure at some point other people were tapped to teach in that Sunday school to our adults. Some was teaching the Sunday school to our children. I believe it was the Germanos back in those days. And then we were people that were in that nursery work, and it took people working at it. We had a, we had a duty to do, and we were trying to do it decently and in order. And over the years, my dad developed this, and we've tweaked it just a little bit to clarify a few things because sometimes you get questions about what does it really mean to be regular and what does it mean to be faithful? <laughs> and those are great words, but sometimes they need a definition, don't they? And again, none of this is meant, meant to be difficult. I think it's all supported from God's word. We won't take the time, if you would excuse me, I don't like the way this sounds, but I won't take the time to turn to every passage in God's word. But I'll, I'll make these statements that come from the worker's covenant. And again, if you don't have a copy, you're welcome to get one afterwards. If you're a worker in our church ministry, if you're one of the 50 workers in our church ministry, we're looking not only to get a fresh background uh, check uh, tonight, we're getting done in the next week, we're also getting a fresh copy of the worker's covenant from you as you commit to serve the Lord. And um, in this day and age, it's interesting. I know we're busy, but I know God's given us something to do, and it's worth giving our life to and worth giving our best to. Number one, we say in our church workers' covenant, some of you are working, some of you are not even on this list, and you want to be. I've been praying about that. 
for some of you. In fact, I had someone talk to me tonight and said, they believe it's time to join our church. I said, praise the Lord. Let's work that out. Let's work it out. Number one, it says here, in order to be a worker in the Calvary Baptist Church, you must confess that you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. We do believe in a saved church membership, <laughs> a regenerate church membership. You may think that sounds almost comical to say it out loud, but church history is rife and full of examples where there were unsaved people that became members of local churches. And you know what that did to those churches? Destroyed them. Destroyed them. You must have a testimony as a saved person. And uh, you have, must have also, secondly, received believer's baptism. Uh, we don't baptize by immersion just because they call us Baptists. We baptize by immersion because it identifies us with the gospel of Jesus Christ. I was just explaining to some children recently who plan to get baptized soon. God bless them. One of them, their grandmother led them to the Lord. Another, their mother led them to the Lord. I'm excited about that for them. But I stood up in the room. I said, remember, this water comes across my body, young fellow. It comes across my body when I stand in that water just like the cross on Jesus died, that Jesus died on. And we will take you carefully underneath that water, just like the grave that Jesus went into. We're going to bring you up out of that water, just like the grave he came out of, alive forevermore. You're identifying with the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a testimony of your belief in Jesus. That's why we baptize by immersion. Uh, we're, we, we, they call us Baptists because of that. But I want you to know it's biblical. It's biblical. It is the scriptural mode of baptism. The only scriptural mode of baptism. The only one. So you not only have you accepted Christ as your Savior, received believer's baptism, you're an active member in Calvary Baptist Church. And so actively involved, not just in one area of ministry, but involved in the entirety of the church. Um, it would be, maybe it should be stated more clearly there, but if you're going to be involved in the Sunday school, we think you ought to be faithful on Sunday night and Wednesday night. If you're going to be teaching in the master clubs on a Wednesday evening, that means you ought to be faithful on a Sunday morning. Uh, we, don't just, we don't want to just come and arrive when it's our time to serve. I understand how that can be sometimes. I was just in a meeting recently somewhere, and I was in a meeting where I was receiving. I wasn't serving. I was receiving. I had to ask the Lord to help me to be a receiver and not to be a server because I'm always used to giving something out, but I had to sit still and be quiet. That's kind of hard to do for me. And let the Lord speak to my heart. So that, that's true, but, but we're looking for, looking for that. So I understand we don't want to just be showing up when it's our time to serve. Let me ask you this, church. If we, only, if we were only faithful to our times of service, would that strengthen or weaken our assembly as a whole? It would weaken it. It would absolutely weaken the assembly. Well, I think we can understand that. But I think it's a biblical principle. Fourthly, we say here, I believe the Bible is the infallible, inerrant, inspired word of God. Someone must agree that the Bible is God's word. If you have any idea that the Bible is full of errors or there's problems or, or, or mistakes, working in this ministry is not for you. You can attend church all you want. <laughs> we love to preach to you about these things and teach you about these things. I don't mean to be rude, but we will have no question about the firm foundation of the Bible. Now, if you have a question, that's fine. Come see me. I'd love to talk to you about it. But don't start spouting that off to people uh, with, without us having a conversation. And if you ever doubt I'm going to disagree with the Bible, I'm not going to be able to do that. I don't think anybody in this room would. But sometimes we have trouble believing things and swallowing things, don't we? Uh, if I was writing the Bible, I would have written things a little differently. <laughs> I sure would have. But it's a good thing I didn't write the Bible. Now, don't, not only do we believe in the, in fact, the Bible's infallible, it's inerrant, it's inspired, it's God's word. He put in the Bible what he wants us to know, yep. no doubt about it. But we agree here in our ministry, you only use the King James Version of the Bible in our preaching and teaching. Yeah. That's all we'll do. That's a settled matter in this church. Uh, that doesn't mean that I don't have other copies of the Bible on my shelf, that I don't ever refer to other copies of the Bible on my shelf. And in fact, someone just gave me a copy of something the other day. It was a comparison between different, different translations. I'm telling you, there's some really weak ones out there, but I'll promise, promise you this. Though I'm not a Greek and Hebrew expert. I've had these classes. This is a wonderful translation of God's Word. Amen. I do not, we do not teach dual inspiration. I believe the Bible is inspired once and it's been preserved God has promised to preserve his word. And so the Bible is not, there wasn't a dual inspiration that took place in the 17th century under the uh, leadership of Mr. King James. And again, he's, he's not necessarily anybody to copy or to, to mimic or copy your life after. Just happened on his watch. But that's a settled matter in this church. I think one of the things that's, that's done more to hurt the, the validity of the word of God and the authority of the word of God in the modern age is the proliferation of Bible versions. That really has hurt that. It's hurt Bible memorization. 
Uh, it is hurt, it's hurt the authority of God's word because there's so many questions when people are reading different things. Now, there's much room to talk about that, but we're, not, we're never going to be ugly about that, but we're convinced about the position that we have. And so if you want to work in this church, you want to teach the Bible in this church especially, we, we can only use the King James Version of the Bible. And we'll be mean about it. That doesn't mean that people who use another version of the Bible aren't going to heaven. Please don't quote, don't say that. I don't believe that at all. In fact, I remember you can take, you can take the Catholic Bible, you can take the Douay Reims and lead somebody to Jesus. The gospel's in there. There's no question about that. But I think we have an accurate translation. I think God has blessed it. And, um, and I think, and, and, I, and I know that that's what God wants us to do. Now, I don't want to mean, to mean to be ugly about this, but you can imagine how much unsettledness there could be in a church that's trying to read every version under the sun. Everybody needs to pick one. We just decided to pick the King James. Amen? Because God has blessed it. And it's a wonderful, completely accurate translation. And God's preserved his word. No question about that. Number five, I will do my best to be an example of the believer and apply the teachings of Christ in moral and social issues of my everyday life and guard my Christian testimony for the furtherance of the gospel. So many things could be explained there, but, but we, we, uh, we have some strong views here that we believe line up with God's word. We don't expect anyone that's teaching the ministry of this church to be, be uh, partaking in alcohol as a beverage. Uh, that's, I believe the Bible teaches against that. We need to clarify that because we need to be as clear as possible in this day and age. But, but that's a great example. You could probably write down and take it to the bank. Yeah. Be careful, I would say, too. I don't, again, I'm just trying to be direct with you about it tonight. Facebook has is, is done more to reveal people's personal habits than anything else that's ever been invented, right? And if you don't want us to know you're doing something wrong, please don't post it on social media. We're not looking for it, but you don't even have to be a member of the Christian FBI to find this stuff out. Now, I'm well beyond the years of trying to find out something wrong. I don't want to know anybody's doing anything wrong. I don't care to know about it. I don't want to know about it. If you're doing something wrong, I don't want to know about it. Sometimes the preacher has to find out things he wish he never knew. I wish I never knew. I don't want to find out. But please don't make it easy to find out. All right? And just don't do anything wrong. How about that? That's a good place to start. But do you understand what I'm saying? Uh, we have to follow God's word. And there's places for questions on everything. Free speech, thought, and, and, and be, being provoked and mentally and all that, I'm for it and discussing things in the right place. But we're not going to create doubt in the teaching of the Bible and the ministries of this church. We're not going to facilitate doubt. I don't mind having a discussion with you about anything. But I'm not going to facilitate doubt in the classrooms of our church and the ministries of our church. Amen. Amen. We can't do that. Let's settle things before we get up. <laughs> I will conduct myself and keep with New Testament principles and seek the help of the Holy Spirit that I may be faithfully, faithful and efficient in my work. I think that's explanatory. I will be regular and punctual in church attendance of all services in the church, including special services like revivals and conferences and unless providentially hindered. No doubt that happens. Just to clarify that, we're praying, and if you, if you, we're praying for you to be here three times a week. We have, we have a, just like any organization, we have meetings. We want all of our members to be at all of our meetings. Uh, if, if, if you've been a member of another club, they want you to be at all the meetings. Well, we want you here too. <laughs> we know that people have to work. Sometimes you, have guys, you guys and ladies have an erratic schedule, and you may be able to be here on a Sunday. You may not because of how your schedule works. Or maybe on Wednesday night, they keep you late or whatever the case may be. But we're, we're asking our people and saying as a standard for someone who's going to serve, and especially in a prominent way, especially in a Bible teaching way, you're going to be here. If you can't be here three times, you would be here at least twice, and then basically that would only be due to your employment. Don't say I can, I can just sit one out every week. That's not the spirit of this. The spirit is, no, I can, if I get two out of three, I'm good. The spirit is, two out of three is the minimum, and that's because we want people to still serve even when their work is in the way and they have a heart for God. Does that make sense to everybody? And so what we're asking you to do in this, if, in this covenant, if that's the case, just put the service that most likely you're going to be hindered in. Again, we're not the Christian FBI. And we're not going to be looking at this all the time. Uh, but if you're absent a lot, it's going to be noticeable. We're not the biggest church in town, so we can tell when you're not sitting in your seat. I will make thorough preparation in my area of service and attend all teachers' meetings, rehearsals, and training classes offered for my areas of service unless providentially hindered. We don't do things like that very often. In fact, we don't do it enough. And God willing, if we ever do, it will be announced well ahead of time so you can make adjustments to your schedule. But we're praying that will be the case for folks. I'll be loyal to the pastor, the people, and the program of Calvary Baptist Church and cooperate wholeheartedly, number nine we're at here, in plans and activities of the Sunday school and the church. Just be a team player. All, all the facets of this church, all the classes, the nursery, uh, we have a ladies' Bible study. We have nursing home ministries. I will start at this week. Thank the Lord we're in three of them again last week. And uh, that's, uh, has a, we have the potential to do that every week. 
have the tension to do that every week and, and even some more places potentially. But all those things should point back to the church. All those things are uh, there. By the way, they wouldn't even be alive if there wouldn't be a church. So I'm in the Titus 2 Sunday school class, men's Sunday school class. There, it, it would never have existed if God hadn't birthed this church, right? So I'm, and our goal in that class and in the class that you're in is to point back to this church and connect that class to the ministry of this church, not to have that class go off and be its own church, but that class to strengthen the whole, not stretch us. And that's true for the couples, true for the ladies, it's true for the Calvary Pearls, all the way down. Does that make sense to everybody? So we wouldn't even be alive if it wasn't for the church. So what we do in these classes and these smaller groups, whatever it may be, any of our functions, they are meant to strengthen the church. In a sense, you might say the church is almost like mother. And then mother gives birth, but we should do everything we can to help support mother as well. Does that make sense to everybody? So everything's connected. I'll contribute my tithe to my church's budget. We expect people who serve in the ministry of this church to tithe. And yes, we have ways to figure that out. Now, we don't hunt and peck for that sort of thing, but we do check on that occasionally. Again, we don't know what you make, but we, we have an idea when people are tithing and not tithing. And because we are starting a new round of all this, we will have, we will have an inspection for that. I don't do that personally. I don't want to know, but I will get a list of people. And we've had to deal with that in the past. And people, thank God, have always been gracious. You just needed a little nudge, a little help. And by the way, I don't enjoy those conversations, but they've been had before, and I can imagine they'll have to be had again. Uh, but let's give to the Lord. You can't outgive God, right? right? But imagine standing in front of a classroom trying to teach on stewardship when you're not even tithing. Yeah. Doesn't work. Nope. Doesn't work, does it? And we do that annually. So it's, we, what, the idea that we're trying to imagine is that our teachers and our workers, and it's not just teachers we're talking to, but our workers would set an example for what we want every other member in the church to be like. Mm -hmm. That's a tall order, isn't it? I've got some work to do as a pastor myself. So I'll, I'll pay the tithe. I will pray regularly for the people and ministers of Calvary Baptist Church. God help us. I'll make witnessing a major effort in my life and be willing to visit regularly on behalf of the church. We're going to try to make some adjustments to offer more opportunities, but we're encouraging people to be available at least twice a month to help with outreach. And this, thank God, this coming Thursday night, we'll have an opportunity for that. And we're going to try to open up more opportunities for that to help people so they can be, be used. Again, you can do everything you want to do on your own, but we're encouraging people to join with us together because we are part of this group to work together in the organized times that we have. That's not to say you can't just take off on your own and do what you want to do. That's fine. I encourage you wholeheartedly, but let's make sure we're working together in the organized meetings we have in our church. Again, be an example to others here. Uh, number 13, I will be willing to use materials in my areas of service that are approved by the leadership of the church in accordance with biblical principles taught in the Bible. So uh, just be careful. We, we're trying to say there, uh, we, we trust our teachers. We're glad for folks that serve in any way that bring materials in, but make sure the materials we're using line up with our principles principles and beliefs. And so if we say we believe one thing and then we go in a different direction, we've got to be careful about that. And so if you have any question, I'm glad to help you with that. I'm glad to do what I can to give you some advice about that. But let's be consistent, right? That's the idea. We're trying to be consistent. And for any reason I cannot fulfill my duty or office, I'll give as much advance notice to the pastor or leader that he's designated as soon as possible. We're encouraging people. This almost sounds antiquated. It's hard to believe it does. I put this, in, I left it in here even though it seems impossible. We're trying to encourage our leaders, people that are serving actively in this church, to try to miss no more than one month out of the year. Yeah. That's four Sundays. But that's getting, it seems like it's getting harder to do. <laughs> in fact, I have tell, people tell me all the time, I want to serve, but I can't commit to every week. If I had a nickel every time I heard that, I'd be a rich man. I think to myself, we won't get much done that way. Sure. Now that's between you and the Lord. But I want to be a part of a church to get something done for God. Let's just make sure we keep God in his rightful place. So we're trying to do that, trying not to miss more than a month out of the year, which is about four Sundays. I assume that could be five if you're stretching that interpretation a little bit. Uh, but try not to miss back-to-back -back Sundays. I would imagine if you could get by two weeks without me, you could get by all the time without me. I don't know. Uh, so try not to do that. Sometimes that's unavoidable. You say, Pastor, those are some high standards. I really don't think they're that high, but I think they're high for the age we live in. I think they are. And as, as always, we want to be able to help and, and discuss things with people. Sometimes you come into seasons of illness. You come into seasons of difficulty. And you know what will solve all problems? I was telling somebody that today. I used to tell this to my young friends at Crown College, very young friends. They seem younger than they actually were at times. I said, if you have an issue, communication solves all problems. 
Even bad communication will help, <laughs> but communicate. If you communicate, then we can work through any problem or anything that needs to be solved. I think we go back to where we're at at the beginning. We have a high calling, yeah. and we're we're to press toward the mark or the prize of the high, call, high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And we, we have to measure ourselves as a church. We want to do what God wants us to do, but we want to do it for God's glory. And we want to be a person that's committed completely to the Lord. And if we're committed to him, then God will allow us to be committed to his church. And then we can work together in the places that God's gifted us and with the talents that we have and the callings he's given us to work together to move forward for the Lord. Not, not being pulled one way and pulled another way, but in concert together, doing our duty. I don't know about you, but I just want to be able to say when I'm done, God has used us to get something done for his glory. And we have to attend to some of these, my, what these, these minute details at times in order to accomplish that. And uh, if you want to serve the Lord in this church, I'm wholeheartedly for it. In fact, I'm always looking for places to get people involved, to get their foot in the door, give them something to do. Uh, I'm sure that takes some people by back. I take some uh, by surprise every once in a while, but I'm always trying to get that done. Uh, but I encourage you to, to let us know, and we can work toward these things and, and get see what God will do. See, so we want to glorify God. We want to minister to families. We want to help children become lifelong disciples of Jesus Christ and everyone else too. So work at it. Let's maintain our devotional life. Let's be faithful to the church of God. Let's, let's make sure that we get this worker's covenant signed and make sure we get this background check done. And let's be prepared. You have something to do in this church? Listen, let's get it done. If we're going to start at 945, let's be ready at 930. Amen. You know, if we're, going, if we're going to start at 6, 630, let's be ready at 615. Let's be excited. Let's be glad for the opportunity. Let's set a high mark in all of it. And let's, let's get it done the right way. And let's see what God will do. And if you have any troubles, you let me know. Sometimes you, you have to miss. And don't be afraid to let me know about that. If someone called me yesterday and said, I can't be there. I can't be there. Can you help me? They called me Friday. Yeah, we'll try to work that out. Try to work that out. We have people that sub in all the time. But I tell you what, when we finish our life, we'll be glad we've been faithful to the Lord and seeing God do some things through us. And you know what gets the job done? I tell the people that work here this all the time. Uh, you know what gets the job done? It's not big, flashy things. It's not big moments. It's not big days or big accomplishments. Consistency is what gets it done. Amen. Consistency. Day after day, week after week, Sunday after Sunday, year after year pins that go from your chest all the way to the floor right all the way down gets it done and God can bless that I really believe in my mom and dad's life that's their testimony I've said that before my mom and dad are wonderful talented people don't get me wrong but it wasn't the huge days in this church that God used them to make a difference in our lives it was day by day by day by day by day 28 years of consistent faithfulness and look what God does and many of us look to them as spiritual father and mother. Many of us look to them and see how God used them to build a foundation in this church along with other people, again, who come alongside and, and you couldn't have a church without. Don't get me wrong. But it's that consistency that gets it done. And we have to hold ourselves to a standard. And we have a duty to do. I believe we do these things. We don't pat ourselves on the back. We just say, Lord, I'm doing what you've given me to do. And he can bless it. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer tonight. A lot of details. A lot of details. We've got them in print. If you, if, if, if you started to fade on me, I've got them in print for you. <laughs> if you have any suggestions, I would love to hear them. As our heads are bowed and eyes are closed, I remember being in a meeting with teachers a few years ago. Wonderful lady. <laughs> and I just asked out loud, I said, I don't know. How, how faithful should teachers be? And, and uh, she just blurted out, they should never miss a service. They should never be gone. I said, well, well you do get sick every once in a while. <laughs> I was like, wow, she was strong. She was very strong. We're not trying to ask people to do anything impossible. We're trying to enlist you to a great cause. And there's a place for everybody to get in. If that's what, if that's what you want to do to serve the Lord, and we will try our best to make it happen. But I want you to know we're not here, we're not here just, to, just to try it without having a goal. We're trying to do our duty. We're trying to give our best for the Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to do this tonight. If you have an interest, I want you to, you could sign, even sign your name on that workers list out there if it's not printed. You could text me or email me or call me or you could let us know through the church office, whatever the case may be. You could take these pieces of paper, get them filled out, get them back to us and we'll work together. If you're currently working in the service of this church, we definitely want you to do that so we can move ahead and renew all these things. It's time to do that. But tonight, will we just commit ourselves together to do our best for the Lord? If, you, if that's in your heart to do as we move forward to reach this community and reach the world, would you say amen, church? Amen. 
A lot of details. I don't want us to get dragged down by them. This, they grow out of a spirit of commitment to the Lord. And if we're committed to Christ, all these other things will fall in order. There's no doubt about it. No doubt about it. Let's stand together for just a few moments. We're going to play a verse of a hymn.